Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of all the Easter eggs and details you missed in Marvel's Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. This breakdown is brought to you by our good neighbors over at State Farm. Okay, let's begin. Quantumania's Marvel Studios fanfare includes, for the first time, an MCU villain. He who remains from the Loki finale added to the top of the A in Marvel, as this movie places his throne room atop an A-shaped tower, and he has a history of dominating other countless Avengers. And in the post credit scene, there is a glimpse of his core corporate variant Mr. Gryphon, who I believe currently sits atop Avengers Tower, renamed King Tower. Then again, He Who Remains was relatively an MCU hero compared to his variant Kang the Conqueror in this film. This prologue scene shows his arrival in the Quantum Realm when he was banished by the Kang Dynasty for starting the same multiverse war that He Who Remains alluded to. Not every version of me was so pure of heart. New worlds meant only one thing, new lands to be conquered. The peace between realities erupted, each variant fighting to preserve their universe and annihilate the others. You can see three pieces breaking off of Kang's ship as it arrives in this atmosphere, perhaps representing the three Kangs who led his betrayal and sabotaged his ship. There may actually be a connection between the three timekeepers and the mysterious fourth broken timekeeper statue, a statue that represents perhaps this exiled Kang. Now remember, Janet Van Dyne had been stuck in the quantum realm since she shrunk between atoms to disable a rogue ICBM in 1987. Now to clear up this frequently asked question, Janet aged normally over the 30 years in the quantum realm while Scott time dilated aging only five hours over five years of our time because Scott fell into a time vortex while Janet did not. Janet just stayed in the normal quantum realm that entire time. Remember, Janet's line in the 2018 film's post credit scene indicated that time vortexes were separate things within that broader quantum realm. And don't get sucked into a time vortex. We won't be able to save you. Now it isn't specified, but the camera does linger on one of those big vortexes in the sky, and that might actually be one of the time vortexes that Scott slipped through, and one of the ones that the Avengers later navigated to go back in time in Avengers Endgame. But this opening gives us a scenario in which the roots of Phase 5 and the multiverse saga begin with two old school characters. Janet Van Dyne Wasp was one of the original Avengers in the 60s comics, and Kang was one of the OG Avengers villains, the time traveling villain from the 1960s comics, who was later retconned to be the same entity as several other time villains, Immortus, Pharaoh Ramatut, Scarlet Centurion, Victor Timely, even the hero Iron Lad. We're gonna meet all of them pretty soon. Kang and Janet save each other, and we don't see Kang again for, oh, another 46 minutes, despite everyone in the movie talking about him in every scene. That's okay, again, we're gonna spend a lot of time with this guy going forward. Scott Lang's opening montage is set to John Sebastian's theme song for the sitcom, Welcome Back, Cotter. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. A kind of callback to the 2018 Ant-Man the Wasp, having an opening montage set to, come on, get happy, a theme song for another sitcom the Partridge Family. Scott's opening narration references time traveling with Captain America in Endgame and how that didn't make sense. Though in Loki, we learned that was something the Kang variant he remains wanted them to do. What they did was supposed to happen. You escaping was not. FBI agent Jimmy Woo, Randall Park makes a cameo. He and Scott finally getting that lunch date. To, yeah, to how you were inviting me somewhere. Like a party or like dinner or something? I don't know, I thought you were no, planned the evening. No, I meant to like arrest no, you. Course, I'll arrest strange. you later again. Take it easy, Jimmy. Okay. Did you want to grab dinner or something? I mean, because I'm free. Yeah, come on. I love how Scott does some sleight of hand to conjure the credit card, something that Jimmy Woo was fascinated at Scott doing in Ant-Man the Wasp. And we saw in WandaVision how Jimmy picked up Scott's close-up magic hobby. Scott gets toasted by YouTuber Ryan Begar and his wife, Mariel Scott. I've actually guested with Ryan on his channel, Watcher. I love that channel. I love the whole team over there. And this makes me so close to being MCU canon. Kevin just called me. You know it would make my life. Scott's old Baskin Robbins boss, Dale, returns to the 2015 film. Now he awards Scott Employee of the Century using his old company photo, and he kept Scott's pink apron and his name tag, Jack, which in the 2015 film, Paul Rudd picked out to shout out his son, Jack. And this goofy award is also kind of a running gag with Cassie giving Scott a world's greatest grandma trophy in the previous film. Now, Quantumania is the 31st movie in the MCU, which is a nice bit of coincidence with the 31 flavors of our beloved Baskin Robbins. Scott visits Bridge Donuts, with all the donuts overpriced at $3.50 per, very typical of San Francisco, and all the different donuts are themed around San Francisco things. The Embarcadero, Summer of Love, The Hate, Presidio, Pier 39, Golden Gate, and The Candlestick. A detail that I screwed up in one of my trailer breakdowns. Like, I'm sorry, I, I now know the Giants don't currently play there. I've only lived in the city for a year. Please don't kick me out of it. I like the parks. Now, the cafe owner is played by actor Ruben Rabasa, who actually played a balloon vendor, Mr. Cardazzo, in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. season 2, episode 12, and a hilarious character in I Think You Should Leave. Uh, any other ideas? Stinky! What? Here he says, Thank you, Spider-Man! 
which is a completely fair mix up considering after that memory wipe from Doctor Strange, no one remembers that Spider-Man is Peter Parker. Hope Van Dyne now runs the Pym Van Dyne Foundation to use Pym particles for humanitarian efforts, reversing deforestation, expanding public housing, food production. Meanwhile, Scott parades on his book tour, which was actually teased in Black Panther Wakanda Forever and in Ms. Marvel when we saw Scott was doing a lot of press tours like his appearance on the This Powered Life podcast. Scott has to pick up Cassie from jail. Cassie now played by Catherine Newton. Jail is where Scott began his journey in the 2015 film, but Cassie is really taken off of both Ant-Mans, including Hank Pym. He kept a shrunken Soviet tank on his keychain, and now we see she shrunk a cop car. On the drive home, Cassie says she protested the city clearing a homeless encampment of people who had lost their homes in the blip, referring to the people who dusted back to find their homes occupied, creating a giant housing crisis. Cassie also says, A guy dressed like a bee tried to kill me in my room when I was six. I've never had a normal life. Yes, of course, setting up the return of Darren Cross in this movie as MODOK. Scott plays a clip from his audiobook. And in that moment, all I could think was how did the Hulk turn me into a baby? Will I be a baby forever? Am I the Hulk's baby? A little after that, a raccoon from space showed up. I don't think he knew my name. I was just happy to meet a raccoon who could talk. Yes, obviously more nods to Endgame, of course meeting Rocket, and that interesting moment where their failed time travel experiments resulted in Scott being stuck in the body of a baby. Which reminds us of how the Avengers accidentally invented a kind of immortality or at least slow aging, which does become important in this movie when their super intelligent ants age a thousand years in a single day. Over dinner, Cassie reminds Scott that he got in trouble for getting back at Vistacorp. That was the company that Scott used to work for, the company that was screwing over its customers. Scott tried to get back at them and then ended up in prison over it. She also brings up how Scott went to Germany to fight Captain America in Civil War. Scott corrects her saying that he fought with Cap alongside Cap since he was on Team Cap. Hank uses old school pin particles to enlarge a pizza and in his ear, we see that he has a hearing aid setting up his frequency entangling with these ants throughout the movie. Pete and Reed confirmed that this pizza enlargement is a nod to the pizza hydration scene in Back to the Future Part 2. And when we enter their basement lab, right away are a ton of visual clues pointing to Cassie and Hank having geeked out over both ants and technology. Cassie's quantum satellite device has a silver and bronze color like a vintage stereo, reflecting Hank's design influence, and Scott sees their huge ant farm right away and how all the ants inside have helmets and have already built a pretty complex society there. The display screen on the other side of the room has a 3D image of an ant on it, and all over the table are textbooks about ants. Janet is super worried. You know how dangerous the quantum realm is. We all do, Mom. Nobody's going to the quantum realm. Hmm, so Janet went from being pretty okay with Scott going into the quantum realm to collect quantum healing particles at the end of the 2018 film to now being completely terrified that Cassie is even communicating with the quantum realm. So what changed? Well, maybe Janet was fine with risking Scott going down there for just a few seconds to a specific region of the quantum realm that Janet could locate, a place that in her years on the run from Kang, she hid in the surrealist rural parts away from the civilization. But it's also possible that the Avengers having gotten away with time travel via the quantum realm since then has reminded Janet that quantum realm based timeline manipulation is a real thing and that Kang is still a real threat down there and they shouldn't risk re-entry again. They shouldn't tempt fate because as Tony Stark said in Endgame, you mess with time, it tends to mess back. So the device activates on its own, but we later learn that it was MODOK hijacking it and the whole family gets sucked in. Scott bumps into the ant farm right away, proving that these ants got sucked in too and that they're gonna come back later. The family gets separated and Scott slaps on the chest piece of his suit. Now compared to the last time we saw him in Endgame, his suit in the opening sequence of this movie has a different chest piece. And that's because this is a form of portable nanotech that contains the entire suit inside, showing how Scott has upgraded to something closer to Stark tech. And after Giant Scott catches his daughter, I love how she proves she already knows how to work this in her own suit by pressing a button on Scott's glove to shrink them back down. What Cassie thinks is the sun behind Scott has stuttered movement, and they realize it's actually a predator. Scott enlarges to take it out, and then pisses off a paramecium looking creature, and they're saved by the freedom fighters. Meanwhile, Janet explains to Hank how there is a whole civilization and ecosystem down here, saying you weren't able to look deep enough, not through the void in Subatomica. There are worlds, worlds and worlds. It's a place beyond time and space. And she says, It's the secret universe beneath ours. She's referring to that moment when Hank and Janet left the quantum realm in the 2018 film and Peyton Reed hid a city in the background. That area with the chaotic visuals must be what Janet was referring to by the void, even though in Loki, the void is a completely different place where he remains banishes things that he prunes. And then she drops the word Subatomica. Now in the Marvel comics, Subatomica is the name of the solar system that's contained within the microverse. That gets contains all the various different planets that you can visit down there. You can actually read a lot more about Subatomica and its various appearances in the Marvel comics over on the fandom Marvel database. They always do a really
doing a good job curating that info. Scott and Cassie are taken to the Freedom Fighter camp where they have to drink the ooze from Veb, voiced by David Dasmalchian, who played Kurt in the previous films. William Jackson Harper plays the telepath Quaz. Great casting as Chidi from The Good Place, the guy in an afterlife, burdened with knowing too much. Katie O'Brien plays their leader, Gentora. Janet takes them to a dune region where she gets a manta ray-like mount that she telepathically communicates with. In the 2018 film, there was a deleted scene in which Janet communicates with a quantum realm creature. Passing through, we stake no claim. And when they soar across the quantum realm on this thing's back, they briefly spot a quantum knot outpost, which has a Kang mural on it. Janet leads Hank and Hope to the city of Axia. The subatomic universe. This changes everything we know about life, evolution, our place in the galaxy. Holy That guy looks like broccoli. Yeah, Broccoli Man is voiced by Graham Fox, who is the onset reader for Crow in Eternals, and they meet up with Janet's old flame, Krylar. Now, Lord Krylar, played by Bill Murray. Now, in the comics, Krylar is a sort of one and done character from the planet Kai in the Microverse, who shows up just in one comic issue, Incredible Hulk 156. Similarly, this Krylar doesn't last too long in this movie before Hank Pym enlarges a squid creature delicacy that, for whatever reason, doesn't eat Krylar. Really let him off easy there. Krylar reveals that Kang had sent Modok, mechanized organism designed only for killing, to hunt Scott and Cassie in the Freedom Fighter camp. Now in the comics, Modok is an AIM technician, George Tarleton, who gets mutated by the Cosmic Cube, but Marvel Studios here has retconned Modok to be Darren Cross, Corey Stoll's villain yellow jacket from the 2015 film. His body parts disproportionately shrunk after he was zipped down to the quantum realm. And as we see, the uncanniest valley in this whole uncanny valley of a film. A montage flashes back to Darren in the 2015 film, his defeat, and now picks back up with his disfigured form of the quantum realm and how Kang restored his body in its creepy little butt. Becomes the source of the mockery for the rest of the film. And by the way, a great resource to learn about MODOK is again, that Marvel database from our friends at Fandom, which also curates every single one of MODOK's known comic appearances, so you can go read all of them. I do love how he has a heart rate monitor on his chest that later flatlines when he dies, and he has a crystal on his forehead that he used to fire a beam at Scott and detain them for Kang. He remains to use Eliath as his lapdog, Kang uses MODOK. Janet finally tells Hope and Hank her history with Kang. She says that Kang's ship could travel the multiverse, and Hank asks, the multiverse? As in alternate dimensions, parallel realities? And Janet says, I didn't believe it at first, but it's real, just as we theorized. So Hank and Janet having theorized about the multiverse back in the 80s makes them predecessors to another couple, Wanda and Vision, having some multiverse pillow talk in the past. What do you know about the multiverse? This had his theories. He believed it was real and dangerous. Now, much like how Scott, Hope, and Cassie shrink and grow to a variety of sizes, people's car insurance comes in all sizes too. A driver with their first hatchback could have very different needs than a Hank Pym level experienced driver with a sweet vintage ride. State Farm's years of experience and industry leadership make them the best choice for your insurance needs, whatever they might be. With over 19,000 agents, State Farm is the good neighbor that shows up for their customers. So whether you're rewatching Quantumania for the third time, or scrubbing through every previous Marvel trailer for hints that Kang was there all along, you'll know State Farm is there too. Just me? Am I the only one who's looking forward to doing that? Call or go to statefarm.com to get a quote today. Janet recounts how, after they saved each other, she and Kang agreed to help each other rebuild and reactivate the multiverse engine core of this ship. And we don't know how many of the other Kangs have this kind of technology, but we have to assume that none of them do, or they all do, now that he remains is out of the picture, but they have a kind of truce where they're able to check each other's infinite power over the time stream, a kind of mutually assured destruction, making this Kang, Kang the Conqueror, the rogue state of them all. The Kim Jong Kang, the one who didn't play by the rules. Now Janet says his ship was neurokinetic, connected to his thoughts. So when she touched it, she saw his mind and felt what he had done. She says entire worlds, entire timelines gone, like they never existed. This sequence uses the same sacred timeline imagery from Loki, but it shows the actions of this Kang the Conqueror tearing it apart. While we see Kang within a single timeline blasting innocents who flee from him, he's causing so many branch timelines on individual scales that the timeline as a whole cannot take it. So it's not just murder, it's load-bearing murders that destroy the fabric of that timeline. And I love how we see Kang's and the lines on his face illuminating as he slaughters these people. Lines precisely where the scars are on his cheeks now. And I'll go into what those scars are in next week's deep dive into this film on the other channel. So just another reminder to subscribe. Janet, waking up from this nightmare, pauses in fear, and Kang is able to see in her eyes that she knows who he is. She asks, who is Kang? The first time we hear the word Kang in the MCU. And Kang, hearing this question, knows that he has hurt so many people in his life, he just knows what it looks like when the person staring back at him knows what kind of monster he is. And I love that he frames his master plan in just a single word, win. What is Kang's plan? To win. 
Janet has to disable a score by enlarging it beyond use with PIM discs. So she had these on her the entire time she was in the quantum realm. These are probably rainy day PIM discs that she was hoping she'd be able to use to escape the quantum realm. But this task is more important. Kang must be trapped, even if it means entombing herself with him. And again, this justifies why in the 2018 film, Hank found Janet far away from the city in the distance. She had to exile herself in the far borders of the quantum realm to stay hidden from Kang. And that explains why in the 2015 Ant-Man, Scott saw her shadow projected on the other side of the border of the quantum realm. She was on the far border of it to get as far away from Kang as possible. Meanwhile, Kang in prison introduces himself to Scott and retracts his mask, giving us a close up look at that neurokinetic overlay and how it clings to his skin perfectly. And as it retracts, you can notice briefly diagonal reinforcement lines across his cheeks becoming visible and the lights on the side of his helmet dim. Kang says he has killed Avengers before. And for the second time in this movie, Scott is confused with the wrong Avenger. You're not the one with the hammer. That's Thor. We get confused a lot. Similar body types. Yeah, Kang has specifically killed Thor, which I speculated in a new Rockstars video might have been done right before Thor sparked Vision to light, since Vision and his multiverse mind would pose potentially a pretty major threat to Kang in another timeline. Kang explains that he knows how all of time ends, saying, Me, a lot of me. They exiled me down here. They're afraid of me. Which might sound pretty familiar to what his variant, He Who Remains, says in Loki. If you think I'm evil, well, just wait till you meet my variants. It just sounds like all the Kangs are really just afraid of each other. While He Who Remains was extremely animated, jumping in and out of his Jets chair, Major's performance as Kang the Conqueror is far more rigid, regal, with the actor described as no moves wasted. He tortures Scott and Cassidy with just a flick of a finger, a gesture that he repeats consistently to swat them down and make commands throughout this movie. But throughout the film, you can see his rage simmering beneath the surface, rising and rising until it all just explodes in the final battle. Scott agrees to help Kang shrink the core so that Kang won't hurt Cassie, and Kang opens a portal to the site. And from here, Scott dives into the probability storm and begins splitting into variants, which Modok describes as Schrodinger's box and Scott is a cat, referring to Erwin Schrodinger's thought experiment to describe the theoretical existence of a multiverse within an unobserved system. Schrodinger's cat was first referenced in the MCU back on Eric Selvig's chalkboard in Thor The Dark World. This concept was also described by Bill Foster in the 2018 film. The object in question would be both in and out of phase with multiple parallel realities. This core is essentially a far more advanced form of Tony Stark's quantum navigator that they used in the quantum realm and Endgame. It's just on a far more controlled scale and produced from a self-perpetuating energy source. It seems like inside this core is a kind of nexus hub for different multiversal realities to spawn from. The bands of this core have writing on them, a language based on circles, which you can see in other parts of the quantum realm. This might be a language that Kang uses and enforces throughout the realm. Now, one of Scott's variants is himself, if he never became an Avenger, and say to Baskin Robbins, screen, another one, if you listen closely, asks him for ice cream. When one of the Scots sizes up, he unravels into ribbons, which looks a lot like what Wanda Maximoff did to Reed Richards. We don't know what's really going on here, why this happens, but it might just be some divine multiversal law that says when you stray too far from your hive of variants, you get like self pruned out of existence. And from here, this scene is just smartly shot by having all the other Scott variants helmet up out of fear, but our Scott stays unhelmeted, which is both a practical way to follow him in the scene and a way of showing his courage and determination to save Cassie. But really, it's Cassie who saves Scott. All the Scots by uniting this whole hive behind their constant. And after shrinking the core back down, Kang meets the rest of the gang and tells Hope, Hello, Jellybean. Jellybean was Janet's nickname for Hope. This is his creepy way of indicating that he knows her. Kang takes the core, swats away Scott and Hope, and takes Janet back to his fortress, where he has this fascinating conversation with her. He projects this sacred timeline around the room, starting with just a ring in his hand. I saw the chaos spreading across realities, universes colliding, endless incursions. I saw the multiverse and it was dying all because of them. He projects that one ring over another ring with branches between the rings veering toward each other and colliding with little flashes. These represent incursions. And after these incursions happen, those branches stay there, just kind of sad, broken ends, showing how one of the universes won that incursion, the other one didn't, and left this ugly scar behind. Now remember, when He Remains first revealed the multiverse in his origin story, he depicted it as one ring floating atop another ring. So I love how this movie's really building on that visual language. And now we see how the Sacred Timeline's eruption upon Sylvie killing He Who Remains in the Loki finale affects another Sacred Timeline. That event, as well as Peter Parker and Doctor Strange's spell 
going awry. And Doctor Strange and Wanda Maximoff dreamwalking and Multiverse of Madness are all examples of these kind of incursions and how one by one they represent a crack in the dam leading to the overall death of the multiverse. What's interesting is this Kang doesn't blame the Avengers for it. He looks down on the Avengers like they're helpless children who don't know what they're doing. Instead, he blames the other Kangs in the dynasty for their childish meddling, childish behaviors beneath Kangs, and he views himself as the adult in the room who believes that order is attained only by conquering. As he says, burning the broken world and building a new one. He says all the suffering will be worth it, defending himself saying, I have lost. You have no idea what I have lost. And I will burn them out of time for what they've done to me. So think about this. When we see Kang in this movie vaporizing people, in his mind, he is burning them out of time, like cauterizing a wound, leaving a scar, sending a message with that scar. And yes, we are left with the mystery of what Kang lost. One theory is that he's doing all this to win back his long lost love of Ravona Renslayer. But I don't know, based on Kang later pummeling Scott after Scott decided to leave his daughter behind and instead into himself with Kang, I have to wonder if Kang might himself have a daughter we don't know about. I don't know, maybe Ravona's actually his daughter. Maybe Miss Minutes is his daughter's soul. I don't know, my mind is running away with me. Hank, meanwhile, was saved by his ant farm, the ant's time dilated a thousand years in a single day, meaning they must have slipped into a time vortex. And in that time, they built a socialistic technocratic society. I think we always forget that the best parts of these Ant-Man movies are the ants. These ants neutralize Kang's advantage of technology hundreds of years in the future because Kang's chosen system of governance is an archaic military dictatorship. He doesn't know how to play with others. Kang mobilizes his fortress to depart the quantum realm with his entire army. He declares, today we conquer eternity and the dynasty of Kang's before Cassie cuts him off. But conquer eternity? Eternity? Interesting choice of words, considering the character of Eternity, as of Thor Love and Thunder, did have a physical form in the MCU, and we're not exactly sure where Eternity is after it seemed to transform into Mistress Love. There may not be an Eternity to conquer, which is an interesting concept, because Jonathan Majors partially based his character on Alexander the Great. What do they say about Alexander the Great? Alexander wept, for there were no worlds left to conquer. And yes, of course, Kang also mentions his dynasty, whom we meet in the post credit scene, and will be the Kangs the Avengers have to face in Avengers Kang Dynasty. Dynasty in 2025. Giant Scott attacks Kang's fortress. This is the largest he has grown yet. In the 2018 film, he bragged to Bill Foster that his record then was 65 feet, or 19.8 meters, which is roughly how big he gets in the San Francisco Bay. In Avengers Endgame, that wide shot of all the portals opening up, Giant Scott, when you compare his height to a nearby human, Giant Scott is roughly 19 times as tall as that human. And if you were to put that human at six feet, because those look like the Wakandans, you know, the mountain tribe, they're pretty tall. That would make Giant Scott in Endgame around 114 feet tall, or 37.5 four meters. But now, based on this one shot where Giant Scott stomps on the quantum knots, those quantum knots, I would say, are about 25% of the scale of that human next to his foot in Endgame, which means that Scott here must be around at least four times taller than he was in Endgame, well over 450 feet tall now, or over 137 meters. Our man is roughly the height of a small skyscraper. And yes, when Scott stomps on Kang's forces, it does mirror how Kang will later stomp on his helmet, as if, of course, trying to crush an ant. Scott picks up a disc-shaped piece of a building and uses it as a shield, a shield that he later wedges into Kang's rings, much like his hero Captain America would, bringing him full circle with his reference membership on Team Cap. He cannonballs into the rings and breaks them. Now, think about this. Kang could have used that multiverse core to power his ship chair alone and escape the quantum realm without going to all this trouble. The reason he fails, really, is because he got greedy. He wanted to bring his entire fortress, his entire fleet with him to wage war on all the Kangs. Because he insisted on bringing all of his stuff with him, he gave Scott and the other there's enough time to stop him. Though in fairness to Kang, you could argue that he felt that he needed all this backup because the moment he escaped from the quantum realm, he'd have the full might of the Kang dynasty on him. This is all a way of saying it's hard being Kang. We get this little moment where Giant Scott celebrates with Giant Cassie. And what I love about the shot is that it was likely one of the easier VFX shots to do since both actors are the same size. But I do like how they slowed down their speech and their movement just a little bit. But either way, father and daughter are finally on the same level. They're finally talking slow enough to listen to and understand each other. Cassie says she's hungry and craves a lime to which Scott says, yes, yeah, citrus, it's weird. This calls back the running joke of Scott always wanting orange slices after he goes big. Does anyone have any orange slices? Scott even had orange slices ready to go when Hawkeye came back from the baseball glove trial in Avengers Endgame. And so Kang, finally allowing his rage to boil over, floats down to the battle on a disc and vaporizes everyone in sight. I love how his neurokinetic armor automatically shifts up his arm and over his shoulders to just get out of the way and give his arms greater flexibility. The Freedom Fighters, despite making some gains when Veb used his holes to Kirby some quantum knots, Kang repels them. He kills Zalem 
and Jintora is forced to retreat, and we briefly see one of the sentient buildings holding the other as it dies in its arms. But facing down Kang is Scott, Hope, and Cassie, where Cassie finally masters a jump tap, and Scott grows large enough to slam Kang against a wall, saying, you son of a, before Kang blasts him off. Remember, Kang, Nathaniel Richards, is the son of a bloodline that traces back to Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic. So Kang might have cut off Scott's sentence to avoid having to think about his lineage. But ultimately, Hank's ants save the day, swarming Kang, and Darren takes Cassie's advice to stop being a dick. Love the look of disgust and anger. Kang gives MODOK in this moment. This is a conqueror who hates be betrayed. And MODOK turns Kang's shield from Kang's color blue to MODOK's color fuchsia, allowing the ants to pick apart Kang's armor and carry him away. They watch MODOK die, his heart rate monitor turning red and flatlining. Janet uses the quantum core to open a portal home, but Scott notices Kang approaching and pushes Cassie in order to stay behind and fight Kang just to keep him in the quantum realm. Now think about this, it's not really explained how Kang got away from the ants, but now I'm pretty worried about the ants and even more impressed with Kang for defeating an advanced technocratic society with the willpower of one conqueror. I don't know, maybe he made side deals with some of the top ant lieutenants, lieutenants, <laughs> to turn on the others, or maybe brainwash them with some fascist talking points that socialism doesn't work. I don't know, I'm impressed. Kang and Scott fight one on one, and I do like it when an epic third act battle boils down to just a simple fist fight or sword duel. Kang's armor is broken off to expose his arm. John of the Majors gets to show off some of that physique and come off like a physically imposing force. Scott is outmatched, but he's able to hang in there because he's not trying to win. I don't have to win. We both just have to lose. Hope returns and helps Scott destroy the core with red and blue pin particles, creating a vortex, pushing Kang into that vortex and shrinking him out of sight. We gotta assume he's not dead because Darren Cross went through this same process. Realistically, Kang's probably stuck in an endless probability storm down there where, unlike Scott, it's gonna be really hard for Kang to cooperate with his variants. So when he does figure it out, ah, uh, look out, we got secret wars coming. Meanwhile, Cassie uses her quantum realm telescope to locate the last known spot where the portal was and uh, reopen. Opens it? I didn't know a communicator could do that, and I thought her communicator only portaled them in before because Modok hijacked it. The logic's kind of fuzzy, but in my opinion, what saves it is that this film's epilogue doesn't really leave things all neatly tied up for Scott anyway. He remains haunted by the consequences of defeating Kang the Conqueror, fearing the Kang Dynasty now. A dynasty that is coming, based on the post credit scene introducing us to Rama Tut, Immortus, thousands of other Kangs, now on a mission to stop the Avengers from continuing to tamper with the multiverse. The second post credit scene is even scarier in some ways, introducing us to Victor Timely, a Kang variant from 1901, who I explained in the post credit scene, might have inspired Howard Stark. But as he goes back through his routine, Scott's eyes seem to linger on people wearing the same shade of bright purple, with purple balloons at Cassie's party, a green cake, purple and green, the colors of Kang's armor. Yes, I know it sounds crazy, but this is where Scott's brain is right now. He's paranoid, he's losing it. And there is a deeper significance to Scott's unresolved paranoia that I will explore in next week's Quantumania Deep Dive, but a few things to note about Scott's changed reality. On the wall by the sidewalk of his morning walk, there's now graffiti of an Ant-Man helmet with a heart around it. Happy Valentine, Scott. And Ruben now knows his name, but still there's a lingering creepiness to Scott going back through his loop of his life as if nothing has changed. Like his life is an episode of a sitcom from which he cannot escape. He is the comedian sitcom star being welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back to a narrative loop written for him by architects controlling every aspect of his life. Architects were now thrilled that he did away with their pesky exile. And yes, I did break down this movie's post credit scenes in another video. For everything else, I bet I brought it up in the Quantumania live stream that I did over on our new channel, The Deep Dive, which is now live with launch day videos that you are gonna love. Please subscribe to it. And you can support our growing network by getting something at nerdriot.shop like this rain eternal shirt, or maybe something from the Deep Dive collection. And thanks to our friends at State Farm for sponsoring this breakdown. And I've been dying to do this all video. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Call or go to statefarm.com to get a quote today. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EAVoss, follow New Rockstars, and subscribe to New Rockstars for breakdowns of everything you love. Thanks for watching, bye.